So good evening and uh, welcome to the final briefings of the capstone workshop in integrative sustainability management here at Columbia University. And a special welcome to those of you who are watching us tonight uh, on the live stream. My name is George Sarah Nicolau. I'm an instructor of the Capstone Workshop and a manager at the Earth Institute here at Columbia University. The Sustainability Management Program, as most of you here know, emphasizes practical skills that you will need to succeed in the workplace. And the Capstone Workshop reflects or epitomizes that emphasis on practicality, on practical skills, and hands-on learning. The objective of the course is for students to synthesize what they have learned throughout the program and to apply it. And they do that by working for clients on real sustainability problems. So tonight, you will hear about four such projects. And what I think you'll see is the key aspects of the curriculum reflected in the analyses that the students have conducted. You'll see elements of general and financial management, economics and quantitative analysis, sustainability policy and science, and you will see the, uh, the intangible skills that it takes to bring a group of people together uh, to work under deadline uh, on a very complex problem. The projects that uh, we will be hearing about have to do with uh, water, energy, traffic congestion, and cleaner cars. And they take place both here in New York State, but also in Mexico City and Tel Aviv. Each presentation is going to be 10 minutes. Uh, then we will devote a few minutes to questions. At the end of that period, I will call a break, uh, during which time you can go back and continue enjoying the refreshments in the back of the room, unless, of course, you're watching on the webcast, in which case there are no refreshments. Um, and then I will call you back uh, after the break for the next presentation, and we'll do that four times. Okay, so let's begin with Catherine Applin. Good evening. My name is Catherine Applin. On the behalf of my fellow classmates and our faculty advisor, Lynette Witter, I would like to welcome you to the final briefing for our capstone work conducted in partnership with Isla Urbana. We are excited to share with you this project on the sustainability benefits of rainwater harvesting and to, to explain how our research led us to a series of recommendations that can help our client optimize its operations as it moves forward. The structure of tonight's presentation will first cover the context of Mexico City and our client followed by the introduction of our vision and the timeline of our growth plan. Mexico City is plagued by a series of water-related issues, such as aquifer depletion, flooding, subsidence, the high energy cost of water provision, as well as aging infrastructure. Nearly 12% of the Mexico City households are not even connected to the central water grid which means that they must rely on water delivery trucks called pipas, which are expensive, inefficient, and carbon intensive. Our client, Isla Urbana, is a young and ambitious organization. Founded in 2009, their mission is to ensure a future with access to clean water by implementing rainwater harvesting systems in low-income communities across Mexico. They contribute a bottom-up solution to complement large-scale governmental projects, providing families with water independence and security. Through the installation of household rainwater harvesting systems, they play an important role in improving conditions around the ongoing water crisis in Mexico City. Thus far, Isla has been concentrated on making a positive impact at the individual and community level. They have also worked hard to expose rainwater harvesting as a viable option to mitigate water access issues 
and they have succeeded. Rainwater harvesting is now on the agenda of the Mexico City government. With 2,800 systems installed, their efforts have improved the lives of thousands of people. But our research shows that they are capable of reaching an even greater potential. In order to quantify this potential, we ran a series of water budget models for the city. Our research showed that if Isla were able to install systems in the equivalent of 50% of the homes not connected to the central water grid, it would reduce the aquifer drawdown rate by almost 2%, as well as satisfy 8% of the citywide water demand during the rainy season. But its current capacity, it would take Isla 157 years to reach this goal. With this in mind, we knew that Isla must grow and here's where our vision comes into play. To optimize the functioning of Isla Urbana through a series of management and funding interventions, which will spur growth measured by an increased installation capacity in a diversified client base, and allow Isla to unlock the aggregated, benefits of sustain the aggregated sustainability benefits of rainwater harvesting. The challenges Isla faces can be separated into two categories. Those that deal with the organization itself, such as a lack of business experience, a cumbersome organizational structure, and the need for additional capacity throughout. And those that deal with funding, as Isla is almost exclusively dependent on the government for its projects. These challenges translate into a rate of installations of only 18 systems per week. In order to grow Isla and thus achieve the potential sustainability benefits of rainwater harvesting, we have put together a set of tools for the short, medium, and long term. This is a snapshot of our timeline for Isla's growth from now until 2030. Each strategy that we have provided builds on the one before, creating momentum and removing barriers as the organization charges forward. This allows an increased installation capacity per week, which is represented by the number within each cistern. In the short term, our recommendations are oriented towards organizational improvements that will allow operations to run at their optimum level. We have provided a variety of tools to standardize Isla's current pilot program within the delegation of Tlalpan. We first ran a CBA and a GHG analysis to gather relevant data for the argument of expanding Isla within Tlalpan. Our CBA showed that installing systems in 50% of the homes in Tlalpan would provide a $36 million net present benefit to the government over the next 30 years, as opposed to continuing the PIPA water truck delivery system that is currently in place. The GHG analysis showed that PIPAs operating within the delegation account for 1.5% of total large truck emissions within the city. These data points help Isla to make their case, not just for a social impact, but for an economic and environmental impact as well. Our tools focused on improving their internal capacity include an interactive monthly calendar, which encourages standardized data collection, a new program entitled IU Care, which ensures systematized product offerings, and finally, the rationale behind the appointment of a COO who would bring business expertise and systems thinking to further refine the organizational structure. Up until this point, Isla Urbana has received the vast majority of its funding through governmental projects, which have provided great opportunity and access when granted, but often arrive with difficult timing and budget constraints. We believe it is essential for Isla to explore other funding options that will insulate its business in the case of changes of governmental leadership that may be less receptive to rainwater harvesting. Our medium-term goals focus on diversifying Isla's funding sources and then spreading operations outside of the delegation of Tlalpan into the southwestern portion of Mexico City, the area with the highest annual rainfall. In order for Isla to be attractive to other types of funding, they must first increase their transparency and accountability, which we suggest should be done through an annual financial report. We have also provided an analysis on green mortgages and microfinancing, which will allow them 
to pursue projects outside of the government and thus lower their reliance on the city and increase their stability. To assist in their geographic expansion to other rainy areas of the city, we recommend the introduction of bespoke products, which will increase their brand recognition and their potential for revenue. The tools that we have provided in the short and the medium term will position Isla in a strategic way to fully take advantage of the opportunities that we have identified. And the long-term portion of our plan focuses on the challenge of meeting Isla's mission of providing rainwater for all. Our long-term deliverables include a group of profiles, which explore a variety of actors from international organizations to impact funds. This data will help Isla to communicate effectively with a diverse group of possible partners. A roadmap lays out a plan for financial sustainability and a kit on media expansion will help to make rainwater harvesting technology understood and accepted. If Isla follows our plan, we believe that aggressive growth is possible. It will move them from the linear growth they are now experiencing to exponential growth by year 2025. This graph shows a visual representation of what that might look like. With the help of the managerial tools and the recommendations that we have laid out for growth and diversification, we offer Isla Urbana an opportunity to realize economic sustainability and to quantify its offer of contributing to the environmental sustainability of the water system in Mexico City. With a significant acceleration in systems installed, Isla will be better positioned to build the conversation about, around a new people-centered alternative infrastructure for water collection and use. And all along, as it has wanted since its founding, Isla Urbana will continue to make a positive impact on the lives of those that call Mexico City home. Lluvia para todos. Thank you. You mentioned the water trucks being a carbon producer for the transport. Are those government water trucks or are those private sector trucks delivering water? Um, they are private sector trucks, but the government pays for the water to be delivered to the areas that do not have access to the central water grid. And so they're actually really inefficient because they can only fill up once and then provide water to one family and then have to go back to the filling station before they can fill up again and then provide water to another family. Can you expand on what you mean by systemized product offering? Uh, yes, so currently Isla is a bit disorganized. And so when they provide a system, they're not always providing all of the things that they could be, which is um, a, a filter that could be changed or a um, documentation on how they may, the family may use the system properly. And so our idea is that it's really important for them to have a packet that goes to every family exactly as it should be. And so we've done some research for them on, on what that should include. Great presentation, thank you. Can you talk a little bit more about the rainy season? You mentioned it a couple of times and how that impacted your both your um, greenhouse gas assumptions and your aquifer drawdown. I'm assuming there is, if there is a rainy season when it's not raining, the water will have to get to them in some other way. So what your assumptions were behind that? So the aquifer drawdown rate is taken, um, if I'm correct, not in the rainy season, so in the dry season. But um, depending on the size of the cistern and the number of members in the family, it, it depends on how long the, um, the family is able to use the water. Some, some families are able to use it for an entire year without ever needing other water, whereas other families uh, can only use it for six to nine months. So one of the things that's important for us to translate to Isla is that that's data that they really need to be capturing because they don't have it uh, for all of the families. So we only had a rough snapshot and we used that as our data. Great job. So uh, now we go from uh, Mexico City to a small town in upstate New York. 
And uh, Mary Foster is our next presenter. Please welcome her. Good evening. My name is Mary Foster, and tonight I'm going to tell you about my team's feasibility study of building a biomass energy plant in the town of Berlin, New York. I'm first going to describe our project and its objectives, then walk you through our analysis that brought us to the best technology option, and ultimately describe the financial hurdles that are associated with this type of project. So first of all, a biomass energy plant uses woody biomass, which refers to the trees and woody plants that are byproducts of forest management. And this biomass is harvested from nearby forests and acts as the input for the plant, which we call the feedstock. This feedstock is burned during a conversion process, and there are pollution control mechanisms in place to help limit the amount of air pollution resulting from this process. The ultimate output is energy in the form of electricity, heat, or fuel. Our client for this project is the town of Berlin, which is located in central New York along the Massachusetts border, about 25 miles east of Albany. And although it is surrounded by abundant forest land, the town's economy is currently suffering. The small population continues to age as younger generations are leaving, and there are no large manufacturing industries that can create significant employment opportunities. So the town is looking for a way to improve its economic situation by utilizing its existing resources, and that's where our project comes in. We were asked to determine the feasibility of building a biomass energy plant with three main objectives in mind. The first and most important to our client was to provide jobs. The second is to support growing industry in the town by utilizing its existing resources. And finally, to promote sustainable forestry practices to ensure that biomass can be harvested in the long term. And based on these project objectives, we first needed to determine the potential size of the plant, which is measured in megawatts for the generation capacity. So using uh, New York State average data and consumer information, we found that the existing load for the town is 2.5 megawatts of electricity. If we were to incorporate additional industrial use in the form of an aquaponics farm that's currently under construction or some other future industry, it would add 10 megawatts to this load, making it a total of 12.5 megawatts. The picture here shows what a biomass energy plant looks like. And although this is about twice as large as the larger size that we would propose, it gives you an idea of the type of land it requires. Two things to keep in mind are the fact that it has to be in an industrial zone. This makes it so that the plant can either sell electricity into the grid or it can sell it directly to a private business. Another consideration is to understand the feedstock delivery route to avoid the residential area as much as possible. Once we were able to determine the potential size and location of the plant, we needed to ensure that the biomass resource was indeed abundant enough to support this project. The procurement process involves three major players. The loggers physically remove the biomass from the forest with permission from the landowners, and this process is based on contracts with the timber management companies. In terms of how much there is available, we found that within a 50 mile and 100 mile radius surrounding Berlin, the removal rate is lower than the growth rate, which means that it is a sustainable harvesting rate at this point. And so the forest resources would not necessarily be a barrier to this plant, but there is one sustainability issue that could pose a problem to future government aid. And that issue is carbon neutrality. There has been a heated debate over whether or not biomass energy plants can be considered carbon neutral. And the definition of carbon neutral is that carbon released from burning the biomass is then captured by photosynthesis of the trees that are regrowing to replace those that are burned. And scientifically, there is less evidence that it would be carbon neutral. A Manomet Center of Conservation Science study stated that if you burn an acre of forest, it releases 15 tons of carbon dioxide emissions, and a standing acre of trees would take 60 years to sequester that much carbon. Most of the support for calling biomass energy plants carbon neutral comes from the political sector. 
So based on this evidence and this debate that we found, our team believes that the local biomass can be considered a renewable resource, but not necessarily a carbon neutral process with the plant. And this issue of carbon neutrality was important to us to address throughout our project, including our overall analysis, which is what I'm going to walk you through now. The biomass plant itself has different options for the conversion technology. <clears throat> Combustion, combined heating and power, gasification, co-firing, and biofuels. We were able to eliminate co-firing early on because it requires a coal plant to already be in place, which is not the case for Berlin. We also chose to pursue the larger plant size because it provides more jobs and allows for more growth, which is something the town very much wants. And since none of the other technologies had any major weaknesses at that point, we looked at other factors to understand which technology would be the best for the town. Shown here is a simplified version of our qualitative ranking system. We looked at four major categories, environmental impacts, social impacts, policy incentives, and infrastructure. And within these, there are multiple factors. Shown here are the average um, average scores for each technology within the different categories, red being the worst, yellow being the middle, and green being the best. Ultimately, we decided that the 12.5 megawatt combined heat and power, or CHP, plant would make the most sense based on our ranking system. So we use this to inform our quantitative analysis to understand the economic impact and financial feasibility of the plant. For our economic impact analysis, we used an input-output model from the National Renewable Energy Lab, which utilizes data from a large database. And we use this to understand the potential economic impact of the plant for both directly and indirectly and how it would impact the town. Some of the major takeaways from this analysis were, first of all, the incredibly large plant cost. It would cost almost $70.9 million to build this plant, which is a significant cost for this town. However, it would provide significant economic benefits for the town, $12.1 million during construction and $4.9 million annually. It also would create a significant amount of jobs, which is important to the town as well. Uh, during the construction period, it would create a total of 84, and uh, permanent jobs, there would be 15 at the plant itself, and the rest, the 19, would be felt throughout the town. So although this economic impact is somewhat beneficial, we found some difficulty when we looked at the financial analysis. So shown here is a simplified version of our overall financial analysis. On the y-axis, we have the price of electricity in cents per kilowatt hour. And on the x-axis, it shows the annual subsidies in millions of dollars. And the left point on the graph shows the estimated maximum attainable subsidy level for this plant, which we estimated to be $2.7 million based on case study research of similar types of plants. And at that level of subsidies, we found that our plant would have to charge 10 cents per kilowatt hour for its electricity. And this would provide a positive net present value, which means that the projected earnings are expected to exceed the capital investment. However, residents are currently only paying 6.5 cents per kilowatt hour, which is the point on the right, which means that in order to sell the electricity at that price, the plant would have to receive over $6 million in annual subsidies. So based on this, we found that the 12.5 megawatt CHP plant is not currently feasible under the market conditions because there's no precedent for receiving the amount of subsidies needed for the electricity price to be lower. To give you an idea of what's happening in the area, there's a plant in Lionsdale, New York, that's almost twice the size, but it could only receive approval for $4 million in annual subsidies in order to keep the plant from shutting down. So if the town were to want to pursue building this biomass energy plant, they will have to wait for electricity prices to be higher. If they do choose to follow this project, we would suggest two things. First of all, looking at the policy incentives available. There are a lot of specific criteria in the different policies that we encountered, so it's important for them to speak directly with the agencies to understand which works best for this plant. And second, to identify potential investors. Because the capital cost is so high, the town does not have enough money to put into this project. So we would look for someone to help sponsor this project.
So we hope that Berlin is able to take these suggestions into consideration to help support their town in the future. Thank you. Thanks for the presentation. Did you account for the impact that the population might create on the energy production if they were to start, you know, uptaking with solar panels, for instance? So we didn't incorporate solar panels as much into our analysis um, because our focus was figuring out how much that they could use from this specific plant. There are some examples of towns nearby that do have large solar projects, so we think that that could be somewhere that the town could go in the future to help um, solve their um, problem in terms of trying to find more electricity, but they do already um, supply their town with sufficient electricity. Thank you, that was a really good presentation. Um, I wondered about the timeline on mm -hmm. your cost-benefit analysis and whether looking at it perhaps through the lens of longer payback rates given the benefit to the town, is something that would change your calculations? So the payback rate was, I believe, 15 years, which is the life of the, the um, equipment. So it couldn't really go that much further out than what we an analyzed. We tried to sort of fiddle with the model to try to make it as beneficial as possible. Um, but unfortunately, at this point in time, it's it's difficult market for the for the plant. Thank you. Okay, in this presentation, we are literally going the last mile. Please uh, welcome Watson Milson. Watson. Good evening, everyone. My name is Watson Millison, and I, on behalf of my team, am here to discuss best practices of sustainable freight delivery to recommend to the Strategic Planning Unit for the Municipality of Tel Aviv, Israel. Here's tonight's agenda. I'll start by going over our project background, the methodology, we'll dive into our recommendations, and then I'll conclude with next steps. So I can safely assume that everyone here has received a package before. It arrives on your doorstep, but do you ever wonder, how did it get here? The package moves from a sender or distributor and through long distance freight transport, and if you live in a city, it enters a zone called the last mile. This last mile zone is the subject of our presentation tonight. According to Carbon Fund, if you ship a five pound package 3,000 miles by air, it contributes 12 pounds of CO2 or three and a half pounds if shipped by truck. Now let's imagine this rate on a global scale, as there's millions of packages delivered every, every day. This volume is steadily increasing as e-commerce continues to rise. And as a result, this last mile has become more complicated. Economies are improving, population are increasing. It's, it's getting messy. Infrastructure challenges and congested streets only makes this more complicated. So Tel Aviv is the heart of the largest metropolitan area in Israel, and it's the cultural and financial center. 500,000 vehicles enter and leave the city, most during the morning rush hour. And this creates competition of different modes of transportation over the paved roads. In response to this competition, the city has created special lanes for public transportation. They've created bike paths, and they've widened the sidewalks for pedestrians. The operation of commercial vehicles in the city is causing conflict in the public space with the bike lanes and the public transportation lanes, and it's contributing noise and air pollution. In addition, there are no designated parking zones for commercial vehicles, and this results in a lot of double parking, which leads to further congestion. Another important thing to note is that there are currently no emission standards for commercial vehicles. However, the city is beginning to look at implementing same levels um, for EU standards for similar vehicles. 
So the growth in e-commerce and deficiencies of commercial freight planning has made it a challenge for private companies to enter cities and deliver packages on time. Our task is to provide Tel Aviv with potential last mile solutions based on best practices worldwide and hoping to improve the sustainability of city freight movement. So let's review the current delivery situation in Tel Aviv. Goods are arriving at a high capacity freight station or port. It goes to a distribution center and then commercial vehicles are delivering the packages to customers and businesses. So the Tel Aviv Strategic Planning Unit is looking to implement a comprehensive freight plan. Phase one is our capstone project. The planning unit has not yet planned for overall city logistics and they're just starting to explore basic solutions. And these basic solutions can be freight parking zones or designated times for unloading and unloading for commercial vehicles like we have in New York City. But nothing's been implemented yet. And while the city is striving to proactively approach the search for solutions and alleviate the current congestion and delivery challenges, we've been tasked with a benchmarking study to aid their effort. Our clients specifically instructed us to look at best practices worldwide. We're gonna look at distribution centers and how these physical spaces, either owned by municipalities or private entities, use these spaces for freight movement with the goal of reducing hazards and conflicts from operations in the city. So, Tel Aviv, is, Tel Aviv is gonna need to engage their key stakeholders. There's the government, there's private freight companies, and then there's a the local community. We began by looking at port cities, cities with high commercial traffic, and cities that our clients suggested. And this resulted in a list of 48 cities. To shorten our list, we looked at cities that had successfully implemented solutions, or had a sustainability plan or a freight plan. And this whittled our list down to eight cities with 15 solutions. And once our client told us to look specifically at constructed spaces, so anything built over land, that we were able to take these 15 solutions and reorganize them into three recommendations. Micro distribution centers, mobile package distribution, and parcel lockers. These recommendations are not mutually exclusive and they can work in tandem. Again, we were asked to look at proven solutions from around the world that are replicable. We looked at what other cities have done through the perspective of what Tel Aviv can learn from these successes. So the first recommendation we're gonna look at are mobile distribution centers. These are physical spaces of various sizes and they're strategically located in neighborhoods in a city close to major roads and highways. They can be in a public or private location like a shopping mall, a parking garage, a residential building, but it's within a permanent structure and it handles a variety of cargo. Let's talk about Beaugrenelle in Paris. This is a shopping complex just south of the Eiffel Tower and just off the Seine. They converted two levels of an existing parking garage and turned it into a micro distribution center. This was a partnership between a logistics company, Sogaris, Chronopost, a freight company, and the city of Paris who contributed 500,000 euros for initial development. As you can see, this solution covers one arrondissement in Paris and two suburbs. There's a 38 reduction um, in total mileage and a 70% reduction in carbon gas emissions. And in addition to these environmental gains, it's a much safer process because you're not loading and unloading in the street. And it's much more efficient because you're able to load these, these vehicles much more effectively. Second recommendation is mobile package distribution. Think of this as a pop-up mobile package distribution platform. It's a two-part system. There's the hub, and then there's the cargo cycle or the electric bike that carries out the last mile delivery. This can be used for customer pickup or it can carry out further deliveries. Most are found in cities and they range in size from one to two shipping containers. We looked at a private solution where TNT, a shipping company, wanted to experiment with a new pickup and delivery system and they called it the TNT Mobile Depot. The city supported this pilot program because they wanted to help TNT prove that this could be a safer system and have less of an environmental impact. And Brussels also provided park space for this depot. 50% of this pilot project was funded by the EU Straight Salt program. As you can see, this serves about 12 square kilometers and um, from an environmental gain standpoint, there was a 60% reduction in total mileage per stop, 
percent reduction in carbon emissions, and it eliminated 900 kilometers of van movements within the city center each week. Great thing about this kind of depot is that it truly is mobile. If one location doesn't work, you could always take it somewhere else. However, these splashy cargo cycles became an easy target for thieves, and about three months later, this pilot project had to be canceled due to multiple thefts. But we can learn from other cities that have successfully launched uh, the use of cargo cities for their delivery systems. The third recommendation we're going to look at are parcel lockers. These were developed in response to e-commerce. An individual orders a good online, you pick a convenient location, and then you're notified with a secure code when it's ready for pickup. Amazon, DHL, and Impost have all successfully launched these kind of programs. In the case of London, these were all over the city. They're in convenience stores, bus stations, um, lobbies of buildings, and Impost had a, a space requirement of five square meters. So that involves the, the, the modular unit itself or the space that the customer used in front of it. There's three cameras that traced all the activity, so it's very secure. And uh, what's great about these is that it's a very fast process. You're not waiting in line to get your, your package. It's secure because you're tracing the, the, the delivery of the package, and they're available 24-7. Another thing is that you don't have to pay anyone to man the station, so costs are pretty low. As you can see, there was a 95% reduction in carbon gas emissions, and that's based from dropping off multiple packages in one location rather than distributing it to different locations. This is primarily a private solution. However, the government has the opportunity to partner with local businesses or private businesses, and they can designate a public, publicly owned space like a bus station for a location for this parcel locker. And the government can also benefit from advertising revenue. So for these recommendations, we looked at the regulation and policy factors. So if we we're going to restrict truck routes, that could potentially incentivize the use for parcel lockers. For funding models, if it's a public model, we can look at the city of Brussels helping uh, launch this pilot program. We looked at different cargo types, so perishable, non-perishable, weight and size. And finally, the different distribution models, so business to customer, business to business, and a mix of both. So we completed phase one for the client. We reviewed best practices around the world, we assessed different types of distribution centers, and we looked at regulation, funding, and distribution models. Phase two is our recommendation for the client. And this is where they're gonna establish and their inputs. They're gonna engage their stakeholders, be it uh, private freight companies, local businesses, and members of the local community. They're gonna determine which solution is more favorable, and the government should begin tracking freight movement to decide which physical locations can work, and then they can conduct a site analysis. Tel Aviv is struggling with moving goods into and around the city for delivery. We presented three recommendations that will help Tel Aviv achieve their goals of improving the last mile freight movement by reducing pollution, reducing congestion, and increasing the efficiency of delivery systems. This is how we envision an improved and more sustainable last mile delivery system for the strategic planning unit of Tel Aviv. Thank you. When you're describing parcel lockers, um, you mentioned 95% carbon, um, carbon gas reduction. Um, can you just elaborate on that? It seemed a bit high. Yeah, the number definitely looks pretty skewed. But basically, when you are taking multiple packages and bring it to one location, instead of taking it to different, uh, delivering it to different places, it dra dramatically cuts down on travel time and standing time. So that's what contributed to that savings. Watson, I'm wondering if you found any cities where the government put the onus on the uh, companies that deliver these packages to fix these problems rather than um, look for these technologies, invest in them, and try to accommodate um, you know, the same number of the same uh, quantity of, of commercial activity. Um, without really 
charging uh, or you know sort of transferring the cost to the companies that delivered those packages? That's a great question. Um, I'm not sure if there's one answer to that question, and not one company is going to be able to completely take on and, and make the cost the same. From what we've understood and on our research is that at the end of the day, it's, it's a combination of different strategies. And if a company is able to diversify its offerings, um, I'm not going to say parcel lockers are the only way that works, or mobile distribution platforms, or micro distribution centers. It, it's, it's going to take a combination of different factors. But yes, a uh, company is, if they want to be relevant and competitive in that marketplace, they're going to need to put some investment, but, work, and, but there needs to be some, some teamwork going on on both sides. Okay, for our final presentation of the evening, we will hear about a New York State initiative to increase the number of uh, clean cars on the road. Please welcome Kalina Gravina. All right. Welcome to our capstone presentation. Uh, my name is Kalina Gravina, and I will be presenting on behalf of my team. And our project was to um, look at whether New York state agencies could use a green revolving fund to accelerate their fleet's adoptions of electric vehicles. And over this presentation, I will start with a overview of the project and also of a green revolving fund, and then focus primarily on our key findings, uh, which we put in two buckets, uh, fund mechanics and financial feasibility, and then go over our uh, further considerations and then leave you with a recommendation. So the transportation sector is one of the largest contributors of greenhouse gas emissions. It's pretty widely known. And um, New York state agencies are working to reduce their emissions in this sector by uh, greening their fleets with um, electric vehicles. And um, some New York state agencies are um, participating in a mandate that commits them to making their 25% uh, of their new vehicle purchases alternative fuel vehicles by 2025. And we're going to use the term alternative fuel vehicles throughout this presentation to describe uh, different types of electric vehicles. So those could be hybrids, plug-in hybrids, uh, or electric vehicles. Um, the issue with alternative fuel vehicles in this mandate is that they have higher capital costs. And uh, New York agencies are working with tight budgets. So uh, the, other, the other important thing about uh, alternative fuel vehicles is that they have uh, a lot of operational savings and maintenance savings. And the DEC, who is our client, um, is leading the strategy for these agencies to uh, take these, reduce their emissions. Um, and they have asked us to look at a green revolving fund because it's a way of capturing those operational savings, which can then accelerate purchases of more vehicles. So we're going to go over what a green revolving fund is. Uh, it's typically managed by a centrally by a budgeting agency. Um, and it requires an initial amount of funding, uh, which is also called seed funding, to begin the procurement process. And the DC has already initiated this step. They've looked into, um, uh, they've uh, secured, a, or sorry, they haven't secured it. They, they have identified $1 million of potential seed funding. And the second part of this process is that that fund would then be lended to the agencies who would use the money to cover the incremental costs between alternative fuel vehicles and conventional vehicles, which can range anywhere from about $2,000 to $13,000. And this is done through an application process. Um, and then the loan terms are finalized in a memorandum of understanding. Uh, the third part of this process is that the agencies start driving these cars. And when they do, the more and more they drive them, the more and more savings they're realizing from fuel and maintenance. And um, that leads us to the fourth part of this, which is that these agencies um, can use some of these savings to repay their, their, their loans while also retaining some of the savings for their operational uh, benefits. Um, and what we have is a self-sustaining fund that allows for procurement of electric vehicles, and then they can also retain some of their savings. 
And green revolving funds are an established practice, especially in energy efficiency projects, but they're not widely used in electric vehicle purchasing. And so our client, the DEC, has asked us to really focus on uh, the feasibility and, and issues uh, surrounding green revolving funds and publicly purchases and to avoid uh, some of the uncertainty around charging infrastructure and other things like that with such a nascent industry. So now we're going to talk about our key findings, and the first thing we're going to talk about is the fund mechanics. We did a survey of 23 green revolving funds uh, focused both in electric vehicles and also in um, efficiency projects. And uh, we outlined our key findings in uh, more in-depth case studies uh, of the most relevant funds that we had discovered. And these are our key findings that we came with from our research. Um, looking at the Harvard Green Loan Fund and also at the Texas Lone Star Revolving Fund, it became really apparent to us how important tracking and reporting is for various reasons, but um, most importantly that it demonstrates the success of the fund. And um, in, in this case, it allowed for additional capital deposits to be put back into the fund. Um, another uh, important th uh, piece of um, uh, information that we got from these case studies were uh, by looking at specifically the Oregon Fund, which was for electric vehicles um, and hadn't been able to distribute any funding yet. And that was me mostly because there wasn't a strong agency outreach plan and these incentives and loan terms were just not clearly communicated. Uh, and then the last point that we want to make in this portion of our, our research is that most of the funds that we looked at, a majority of them, used interest rates. And interest rates um, provide a, a lot of benefits, um, including uh, more money being put back into the fund and also uh, protecting the fund from inflation. So now we're going to look at how this would look for New York State agencies using a green revolving fund. And we made a uh, financial model. Uh, we used information from the DEC, we used research, and then we also used a set of assumptions, which we just want to call out here. Uh, we extracted $100,000 from the seed fund to use for administration needs, and that left us with an actual investment amount of $900,000. We also used an uh, annual mileage estimate of 24,000 miles per vehicle based on the DEC's information, and a payback period of eight years, which is the life of the car. Um, we also computed this model over four different vehicle types, and we used the Nissan LEAF as the EV, the Chevy Volt as the plug-in, the Ford Fusion as the hybrid, and the Chevy Impala as our non-EV traditional car. So with these four different types of vehicles, uh, we modeled them in three major buckets, and uh, looking at the graph on the left, and uh, the, the first two graphs on the left, you can see that all electric vehicles, which is the purple um, line, has the most significant reductions in greenhouse gas emissions and on annual operating costs. However, looking at the capital cost graph on the far right, you'll see that they're still significantly more expensive than the other types of vehicles. And so our next part of this process was seeing how these different vehicle types um, play out over time using a $1 million seed fund with a green revolving fund structure. Um, and looking at the amount of vehicles that we would be able to be, we would be able to purchase with our green revolving fund model, you can see that in fact there is an increase in the amount of vehicles that we could purchase with a green revolving fund, um, and also that hybrids are we could purchase a lot more hybrids than the other types of electric vehicles, um, and that's mainly because of that very low capital cost that uh, hybrids have. Then we introduced a third scenario to our model, which was to add an interest. And what we found there was that we could uh, increase the amount of hybrid vehicles by almost 200 using an interest rate. Uh, it wasn't as feasible for the other two um, because they are much more expensive and the repayments would be harder for the agencies to handle. However, we then added how uh, this 1700 number, which is the amount of vehicles that would need to be purchased in order to reach the 25% by 2025 goal. And you can see that even with interest, we're not reaching, we're not getting close to that mandate goal. So uh, this is an issue with seed funding. Uh, we don't have enough seed funding to reach that goal. 
So our main findings for the financial feasibility portion of our research is that, yes, a green revolving fund could result in more purchases than a one-time fund, um, which that would be a fund that you would use uh, to, to um, pay for the difference in costs instead of having a, a eight years of purchasing with a revolving fund. Um, and that more, ve so more vehicles could be purchased with a revolving fund, especially with hybrid vehicles, and that the actual aggregate um, DHD reductions, because we've purchased so many hybrids, are a lot hybr higher than uh, the other types of vehicles, even though they provide uh, a lot of, um, a much more significant reduction in GHD by, by vehicle. Um, and then also we could allow an interest rate on, on hybrid vehicles, which would mean that we could make this fund revolve faster. And then our second key finding was that we would need to seek additional funding uh, in order for to reach that 25% goal by 2025, and that could either be through seed funding or ca future capital deposits. So now we're going to look at some of the external impacts, and the first one is fuel cost. We did a sensitivity analysis of a 20-year high and a 20-year low and found that uh, the all-electric vehicles and hybrid vehicles uh, and sorry, all electric vehicles and plug-in vehicles uh, would in fact be uh, affected if the fuel cost was to go below $2. However, hybrids are not at risk and the savings would be retained at most fuel prices. Um, and also, we believe that making an investment in technology provides for more long-term stability than the volatile commodities market. And then the second, the second external factor that we looked at was the changing vehicle cost. And um, the fact that batteries are, battery costs are falling so rapidly um, and batteries make about a third of the cost of an electric vehicle has um, a, lot of, um, uh, a lot of analysts are looking at this, like Bloomberg New Energy Finance, who projected that, uh, they, that electric vehicles would reach parity with conventional vehicles in less than 10 years without a subsidy. And that's significant because public fleets couldn't access those tax incentives. So, uh, we think this is a good time to implement a fund like this. And our uh, major recommendations, our final recommendations, are that uh, the DEC should pursue a green revolving fund um, and focus on hybrids and use an interest rate. Um, that also additional funding should be um, considered to achieve, achieve the state's goal. And that the DEC can use our best practices that we outlined in our case studies, um, but also to focus on these three here, tracking and reporting, agency outreach strategy, and having clear loan terms and incentives. Thank you very much. Kalina, do you think that there's an opportunity for private investors to uh, participate in a revolving loan fund that uh, serves state agencies? So we broached the subject with our client, um, and our client was not uh, wanted to explore um, not having any private involvement in this. Um, however, we do believe that it may be an option in the future. Um, there's a lot of pu private public partnership opportunities in general with the car manufacturers and, um, and that's something that there's a discussion around but uh, the DEC really just wanted to focus on uh, not having a private involved. Okay, so no All right. <laughs> what always... Uh, impresses me about these final briefings is that um, there's a great variety in the projects. Uh, there's a variety in among the clients that uh, the students serve and in the places where these projects uh, take place. And yet uh, the same set of students uh, is able to uh, help these clients. And I think that that's a testament to um, the program and the curriculum and, and the hard work that you all do. Um, all four groups did an excellent job tonight, and so the first thing we have to do is uh, give ourselves another round of applause. Uh, 
before I stop talking and, and let you go, um, I'd like to acknowledge the faculty advisors who worked uh, with each of these teams, and uh, let me do it in alphabetical order, uh, provided that I can still remember my alphabet at this point of the evening. So, um, Thomas Abdallah, Suzanne DeRoche, Kizzy Charles Guzman, and Lynette Witter. Uh, I would also like to uh, thank those of you who joined us here tonight as guests and those of you who watched uh, through live stream. And finally, I'd like to wish those of you who are graduating here um, good luck and uh, a long, successful career in sustainability. We definitely need you. So congratulations and good luck.